Welcome back. Hopefully you had some fruitful um, discussions. Probably you grabbed some cold drinks for our plenary session now. Um, the plenaries tonight, it's actually the first of this year's IFC, uh, work like that. We get some input first. It will be about half an hour, could be 25, could be 35 minutes. And then there will be a Q&A session. And as we did with the specials this afternoon, the first part is publicly streamed and the Q&A session isn't. That's only for registered delegates of the IFC. So we can discuss things probably a bit more openly. Please use the chat. Um, Leslie and Adrian and Johannes are sitting down there. They're posting us some questions. If you have them, just post them and we'll make sure we will pass them along. It will be in total this session about 70, 75 minutes. And tonight we talk about investigative research and research networks. Let's start in 2016. There was the Panama Papers um, about offshore shell corporations which were used for fraud or tax evasion. And at the heart was the Mossack Fonseca, that's a Panamian law firm. This was made public after an anonymous source, a John Doe, approached a reporter of the Süddeutsche Zeitung in Germany. 2017, there was the Paradise Papers, confidential papers about offshore investments. These papers were leaked to two German reporters of Süddeutsche Zeitung, and they shared them with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. And then 2019, there was Ibiza Gate. At the heart of the story was a video of the former Vice Chancellor of Austria, Hans Christian Strache. The scandal became public, by the way, at the 17th of May, so not exactly, but relatively close two years ago. And the video was leaked to two reporters of the Süddeutsche Zeitung in Germany. And these reporters are Bastian Obermeier and Frederick Obermeier, slightly different spelling, not relatives, Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative reporters from Germany's Süddeutsche Zeitung. And how did they do all that? That they can tell us themselves because they will be our guests tonight. And there they are. So good to have you here. Thank, Thank you very you. much. So the next half hour is yours. Thank you. Um, first of all, it's uh, very sad to have this meeting via internet and not see us here, here in person in Cologne, but we will try to make our best out of that. Three years ago, we received a very strange message. Someone had approached us with um, the message that there was m material that showed that someone very high up in a European government seemed to be open for corruption. Would we want to see that? And we said, of course, yes, we want to see that. So we had to travel. We had to go to a city that we can't disclose now. And there we met in a hotel room um, very late at night. It was a Friday night. And it was um, around 10.40 or so. And we had to give away our phones. And the phones were stored in the bathroom. And we were padded down to see if we had any other, any other devices. And then um, we went into the hotel room that was full of monitors and computers and all that stuff. And we very soon understood why, because they wanted to show us a video. The men who we met in, in, on that evening were highly nervous, and so were we. And the whole setting was like in a very bad movie, to be honest. Then those men, they told us that the country was Austria, and the person high up in the government was the then Vice Chancellor Heinz Christian Strache, um, who is a very known right wing populist. They also explained that us that they had set a trap for him. Um, a woman who posed as a very rich oligarch said she wanted to invest money, like hundreds of millions, in to his campaign, but of course um, she wanted something in return. And now let's see a part of that video that we saw in this hotel room. Uh, we brought it with us. And we hope. Das ist 
So the idea of this video um, was that this woman that you haven't seen here because uh, um, we took a part of where you only saw Mr. Strache, who was the one, um, you know, very much in the front of the picture. Um, you can see him now also. And if we move one ahead, then you can see some of the other persons who were involved there. But you can't see actually the oligarch for source protection reasons. That's, that's what I'm going to say now. <laughs> um, um, we also had always blacked her face out, kind of. So the idea was that she promised to buy the most important medium of Austria, the Gronen Zeitung, and would push him in the next election. And what she want, wanted in return was to make more money out of her money. And he was very open for that. And that was our big surprise. He promised her state contracts when she would help him. And uh, he even said it may be possible overpriced, which means she would make more money and it would be not to the benefit of his country, to say at least. And um, so, but the problem was we met someone who set a video trap for someone else. And so when we were in this hotel room, we had to be afraid that maybe there was another trap set for us. So we had to be very cautious. And we discussed this in a podcast that we made later and published a year later in cooperation with FIO here in Germany. We had nine episodes and we are now playing, hearing two minutes of one of those episodes where the two of us speak about exactly that problem. Wir, wir haben auch in diesem Moment ja damit rechnen müssen, dass jemand uns vielleicht eine Falle stellt. Dass dieses ganze Setup nicht nur seltsam war, ähm, ähm, weil es ein Wichtigtour ist oder weil es eben wichtig ist, sondern weil uns jemand reinlegen wollte damit. Und dass wir in diesem Moment gefilmt würden, ähm, nachdem wir offensichtlich schon andere heimlich gefilmt worden waren. Und Frederik dachte auch sogar, dass das Schauspieler sind. Damals wussten wir nicht hundertprozentig, dass es Herr Strache ist und Herr Gudenos. Wir wussten nicht, ob es womöglich sehr, sehr gut geschminkte Doppelgänger sind. Wir wussten auch nicht, ob das nicht womöglich sogar die beiden echt sind, aber sie ein großes Schauspiel aufführen, um eine Falle für Journalisten zu stellen. Wir wussten auch nicht, ob dieses Video womöglich manipulativ zusammengeschnitten worden ist. Und deswegen machen Bastian und Frederik in dieser ersten Phase der Recherche auch keine Luftsprünge oder so. Sie staunen, sie sind aber noch verhalten. Und es ist natürlich immer dieser Hintergedanke da, ja. wenn das alles stimmt, dann ist es eine Wahnsinnsgeschichte, aber eben nur wenn. Es war also von vornherein so, dass, ähm, dass es ganz offensichtlich war, und das haben wir dann auch sofort dort kundgetan, wenn wir darüber irgendwas machen, brauchen wir die Daten in die Hand. Wir müssen das Video selber haben, wir müssen es analysieren lassen und wir, wir müssen es überprüfen lassen können. Und wir haben schon gesagt, wenn das alles stimmt, dann ist es eine Wahnsinnsgeschichte. Aber dieses Wenn ist für uns der entscheidende Faktor und deswegen irgendwie können wir jetzt noch nicht mal sagen, ob wir eine Geschichte machen würden und erst recht nicht wann und wie lange wir brauchen würden, sondern wir haben immer nur gesagt, sobald wir das in die Hand bekommen, können wir einen Plan erstellen. So we were in the strange situation knowing of a video that if it turns out to be authentic could be um, explosive. But how do you check and verificate a video that you don't have in your hands? Because we only saw that video um, in the hotel. So what could we do? Um, we did double check as much as we could, because of course we had written down as much as possible that what we have seen, what we have heard in that video. So what we did is we checked and double checked that. It starts with the simple stuff, 
was Mr. Strache and Gudinius in Ibiza at all at that time? Then, as you have seen, Mr. Strache is smoking a lot uh, in this video. And you should know that Mr. Strache is like a, has an on-off relationship um, when it comes to cigarettes. So we had to check if at that uh, point in time he was smoking at all. And he was. So that was the easiest one. Then we checked, of course, names that he mentioned, um, activities that he mentioned in that, uh, in that video, deals that he mentioned. And then, finally, um, we were able um, to get hold of the video itself. And that's when it already start the real work started for us. Because before, we already had uh, uh, spoken with colleagues in Austria, for example, with whom we have a long-standing relationship with the magazine Der Falter, and we already heard from them that they also heard, have heard rumors before that there must be such a video. So when we got hold of the video, um, we started the real verification process. We, for example, um, we hired a professional translator, a pr translator that is normally used to translate in German courts, and we asked her to translate the parts of the video that are um, in Russian. We then, of course, um, needed a translator. I mean, we are coming from the, the south of Germany. We understand a little bit what they say in Austria, but not everything. So, of course, we brought in colleagues who understand Austrian. We brought in a real-born uh, Austrian, Leila Alsterori, and she found so many other more stuff, heard more stuff that we would have missed without her. We then also um, we hired a forensic expert an expert who is normally used um, to state in court as a witness if he thinks that a surveillance video is real, if a person on a surveillance video is really that, um, that person that is now on trial. So um, he checked the video and he came to the conclusion that at least the, the video is, in his opinion, authentic, that there is, it was not um, manipulated at any part, but there was still the one question. Is it really Mr. Strache? Is it really Mr. Gudinus? We knew those, uh, those politicians um, only from videos, um, from press photos. But I personally have never met him, neither did, did Bastian. And we are all living in a world of deep fakes where you can manipulate a video, for example, of Mr. Obama, Obama saying th something about um, Mr. Trump that he has, would never say, at least not in public. So how could you um, uh, uh, prove that it was really done? So, when we came to that forensic expert, he asked us a simple question. Do you have pictures and photos of their ears? And we were like, what? Of their ears? Are you sure that you are the one expert that everybody recommended to us? And he was like, yes, a ear is like a fingerprint. So he asked us for photos of the ears of Mr. Strache from the front, from the side, from the back, and compared it with what he saw in the video and came to the conclusion that it is, um, in his opinion, definitely them, because it matches as a fingerprint. So, finally, we had the video. After more than a year of, of waiting and, and, and hoping, and, and well, we didn't beg, but we were really, really, really trying hard to convince our sources that we were the right persons and, and the right outlet as Süddeutsche Zeitung to receive the video. But then we had to realize that we were not alone anymore. We had to realize that they had already also spoken with Der Spiegel, which is like our main competitor in Germany. It's a weekly magazine, and we don't really like each other because they are having the scoops that we want to have, and we are having the scoops that they want to have. So usually, you know, there's a fierce competition between us. But in this case, we had the sense that we really wanted to avoid a rat race, as we call it in Germany. You know that, that we tried to be you know, faster with this story published before they did. So we thought about it, and then we gave him a call. And it was a really strange phone call because we had to act like, we had to say, well, we are working on this story. Um, about uh, a video um, that has to do with Austria and with a, an island, and I think you know already what I'm speaking about. <laughs> and the guy on the other side was like, yeah, I, I think I know what you're talking about. And, and then 
we agreed that we would form a cooperation on this topic exclusively, nothing else, but we would work together and, and we would share our secrets and we would try to find calm and, you know, related only to the issue, a way to publish it once we get it a hold. That was a couple of months before we really got it in our hands. Then we had another problem, um, because the one thing was the language, you know, the dialect, the Viennese, as Frederick mentioned, was kind of difficult to understand for us. Um, but then also we needed to know more about the law and about the persons, and so we needed a partner in Austria. So we invited the Falter, der Falter from Vienna, to Munich to work with us. And Florian Klenk, their the editor-in-chief and a very renowned investigative journalist himself, he came to Munich and we sat down in our offices and we watched the seven-hour-long video that we had received. And it was, I think for, for him, <laughs> it was like one of the moments of his life that he will not forget because it was his country and his vice chancellor that he saw in Ibiza behaving like someone in the next bar and, you know, selling half of the country to some Russian oligarch that wasn't even a Russian oligarch, but whatever. So he helped us a lot with the fact checks because those guys are reporting and investigating Heinz Christian Strache there for many years. He used to be a neo-Nazi and then a politician, so they know him, they know a lot about him, and one, of, one member of the Austrian team, she even wrote a biography about him. So that was very helpful. But they also could explain the legal, the legal implications of, for example, when Strache offered the Russian oligarch that she could give donations, but that the regulatory authority doesn't have to know about that which is just plain against the law, but not very clear from a standpoint in Germany. So um, we worked um, with the Falter very hard, like for a week, day and night, until we had all the last checks done, all the verifications done, and, and were positive. We had, of course, approached Mr. Strach and Mr. Godinus. They said they were a little drunk and they couldn't remember <laughs> a lot more. And uh, so, we pushed the publish button and what happened immediately on the next day that you can see on the next slide also is that um, the government exploded. Mr. Strache had to step back on the very next morning after we published and Mr. Kurz, the then and now again chancellor, he called for snap elections. So um, that was that about Mr. Strache's future. And it was another chapter in, in my opinion, in the history of journalism that proved that we are living in a, ch uh, in a time in a new era of journalism. Um, we leave behind the era of the lonely wolf journalists uh, in I investigative journalism and we move to an era uh, of the power of the pack where m journalists team together, they team up across borders, across media um, borders to investigate stories of immense public interest. When it comes to collaborations, um, we at Süddeutsche Zeitung um, have a several year long um, history now and experience because we have a long standing relationship um, with two public broadcasters here in Germany, with NDR and WDR, and together with them we are teaming up for bigger projects, for bigger investigations, where we think that it's important to not only one group investigating a topic, but also different groups, TV, radio, print, together. When it comes to international projects, Bastian and I, um, our first international collaboration was Offshore Leaks. So that was our investigation about um, tax havens, about offshore, the offshore industry that was published in 2013. And then several years after that publication, um, we got what I would in those days or nowadays call a present. A whistleblower had approached us and offered us material. Material from a financial service provider um, called Mossack Fonseca. Um, and this offshore service provider uh, was already renowned um, for doing business with shady figures all around the world. But it was only rumors. 
And what we now had in our hand was 2.6 terabyte of data um, from a, a whistleblower calling himself John Doe. Um, and we decided to share this data. We decided to share it with 400 journalists all around the world, organized and brought together by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, um, because we saw that there are so many traces in this data that we ourselves as German journalists would never be able um, to investigate in a lifetime. We also saw scandals that, if we are honest, would be a rather small article in a German newspaper, but it could be a very big headline in a newspaper or a TV show of countries in, on other continents. So we decided that it would be in the public interest um, to share the material. Um, to work together with other journalists around the world and give them the possibility to work with us in the data. But if I emphasize now the public interest, I must also say it was in our interest um, to share the data. And I think that's something we should always keep in mind when we speak about collaborations in, jo in journalism. If you work together, you share a risk. It's not only me. It's not only me and Bastian um, being at risk because we have something in our hand, data, where we know that there's, it's organized crime figures in there. It's one of the best friends of Vladimir Putin in there, the cousin of Bashar al-Assad of Syria. But we knew that if we share the data, you would never be able to stop this investigation. Because if it were only the two of us, you could do harm to us. But if you share data with 400 journalists all around the world, you can never stop such a project. Furthermore, let's face the facts, it's share worked. What other colleagues do and investigate, um, that's a work that we do not have to do or that we only have to double check. Furthermore, it's them bringing in expertise that we would never be able to learn. For example, um, our colleague in Iceland, um, we saw the prime minister at that time of Iceland in the data. And we must admit, or Let's make it my confession, not our confession. I have never heard of that guy before. But our colleague Johannes Christiansson from, um, um, from Iceland, he of course has, had heard about uh, that politician and he had investigated him for years. So it was tremendously helpful um, to have him in such a project with his expertise. When you share work, you can, we are able to do by far more stories. We did several calculations how long it would t take us um, to investigate the whole Panama Papers. And the whole Panama Papers means us working our whole lives. Um, and that's what not, I mean, Panama Papers are interesting, um, but that wasn't at the plan. And there's also something that I didn't realize at the beginning, but that I now realize. You have by far bigger impact. When we decided, or we together with our bosses um, decided to share the Panama Papers, we had colleagues who asked us if we are, I mean, I, I'm not sure if they used stupid, crazy, or something like that, <laughs> to share a scoop. Us giving away something that we as Süddeutsche Zeitung could have on our own. It's like us giving away a piece of the cake. Now I realize, yes, we gave a, a, away a little piece of the cake, but by bringing in others, they brought other ingredients to the cake. So the cake was by far bigger. So giving away a piece of this cake was only a small crumb, but our piece was in the end by far bigger than the original cake. But to make such an investigation a success and not a red race against each other, against one media outlet against another media outlet, you need rules. And if we all like cake, at least I do, no one likes rules, especially not journalists. So, um, and you all know how it is to work with one journalist or two and how difficult that can be. We had 400 of them, 400 colleagues around the world, and it was um, really a problem because we needed to make sure that we all can publish the way we wanted to publish. And once we started to get in the many colleagues, um, 
first 50, then 100, then 200, we were kind of sure that we would, you know, lose the one or the other story uh, along the way. Because, you know, the, the best way to get the best kept secret of a journalist is to, to buy him two beers. He is going to tell you what he's working on, because he's so proud on that. So what we needed to manage, we needed to get behind the egos, the egos of the persons that we're working with. One way is, is um, the, the, the concept of radical sharing. Whatever one of us found, one of our group, he immediately shared in the forum, which was like an internet, Facebook, uh, no, Facebook for journalists, Facebook for investigative journalists, where you can make new posts about your findings, and you can like posts, and you can comment posts, and that worked really fabulous. The next thing that we made, we had to make the people clear is that they really had to shut up. And if they needed to speak or write someone, they needed to encrypt. And that was, you know, easy said, but um, hard done. It's now five years ago, and since we started the project six years ago, and, well, encryption was not as a daily routine as it's now with, for example, encrypted services like Signal or even WhatsApp is <laughs> nowadays encrypted. Back then, there was, you know, very little opportunity, but we had to insist on that. Then also, um, we were working with colleagues worldwide, so we had to, we, we had to create awareness for cultural differences. Colleagues in Italy are completely different in their methods as than, than colleagues in Germany and colleagues in Southern, Southern America or, or in Africa or in Australia. So we really had to take that into account and we really had to give us all the benefit of the doubt. And then we had, we had, to, we had to create the awareness for different needs. TV have other needs, TV people, then radio, then print. I mean, we can just write it down on the last day. That's impossible for our TV colleagues. So we had to wiggle around that. And then also, um, and that may sound strange now, we had to tell everyone that we need to be transparent as soon as someone involved has a conflict of interest. What does that mean? We had one colleague, she found her boss in the Panama Papers. So that's a problem for her. But it's a problem that we need to be informed about, so we can speak and we can find a way around that, and how we still can publish that story, and you, just, you know, so that no one can accuse us of, you know, burying stories that we don't like and make stories speak that we do like. But um, well, and then there's, it's very obvious we have to give each other credit when when I'm publishing a story about Iceland, for example, that Frederick mentioned and a lot of reporting is done by our colleague in Iceland, I have to credit him. I have to name him in the article, and I have to say that part of the research is his, and not only mine. And that works in both ways and around the world. And it was fantastic, because we had so many pieces where we had colleagues from Ecuador, from Sweden, or from whichever country in our bylines, which is really a funny thing to have, because it makes your paper so international from one second to the next, and I really like that. But the, the, the most important thing regarding publishing was that we all promised we would all publish on the same date, on the same time. And that's very important because if one of us had to be afraid that he or she would be scooped, you know, that like, let's say the Guardian is, you know, publishing their biggest stories two weeks ahead of everyone else, then why would you not go one week earlier? So um, this is like a race to the bottom. So we, we had to, we made everyone sign an agreement, a memorandum of understanding that says we all publish on the same date. And we thought that's fine. I mean, we can trust each other. And we built the trust to working with each other for a year. And not a single story left our, our small collaboration. <laughs> um, but then in the, in the last weeks, our lawyers, you know how lawyers are, our lawyers came up to us and said, hey guys, um, we would, would like to have a look at the contracts um, because we want to know what can we do if someone scoops us with our material that we shared you know, with 
the, the many, many colleagues in the world. And so they looked at the contract and then they came back to us and, uh, and they say, well, there's nothing we can do. Aside from really, really, really hating those people who scoop us. But we, we know we can't find them, we can't sue them. It's just nothing. It's just they are journalists. They can decide when they want to publish their story. And that's how journalism should be, honestly. So we had to have this big, big trust. And, and to our huge surprise, it worked. The team spirit prevailed over the egos. And this is why the Panama Papers was such a huge success. As we can see, um, here is like uh, some images um, of, of the headlines around the world. I think we have another um, 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 part of that. Um, no, this is um, when, when we published, there were mass demonstrations around the world that you just saw in the, in the other picture <laughs> that I swiped away. I'm sorry. Um, so around the world, people hit the streets and expressed their, their anger about what we told them. And uh, we had, you know, um, the head of state of, of Iceland had to step down and later the, the head of state of Pakistan went to jail for, for what we found. And so th there were uh, many, many, many revelations we had. I think we had alone. 5,000 stories that originated out of the Panama Papers around the world. So 5,000 different stories. And I think we may know about one third of them, maybe a little more. And, but this is really, um, it's been astonishing and it's been one of the big adventures of our lives. That's it. Thank you so much. Frederick and uh, Bastian. Please come over and have, have a seat over here. Thank you so much for this, um, this input. This is, um, I have to say, it's, <laughs> it's impressive. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's uh, very nice of you to share this, especially how many uh, aspects are in there uh, involved over the couple of years. Um, we have opened up the chat. So if you have some questions for um, Bastian and or Frederick, just let us know. It's quite funny because the um, first question in there will be about uh, money, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but first of all, let me say, the, because there's a question in the chat, the podcast is called Going to Ibiza. Is that right? That's uh, the title of the podcast, Going yes. to, to yes. Ibiza. Yeah. Is that quite, let's start there, because this is like a, a, um, a conference for audio documentary uh, makers. Is it, is it common for the, for the Süddeutsche Zeitung to pursue this line of medium to say, well, look, we have a big research, we do this as an audio production as well at the moment? Well, in nowadays it's um, getting more and more common. Um, I th we started several years ago when we realized, um, our colleagues realized that if we are doing a year-long investigation, for example, as the, in, uh, the uh, Paradise Papers, that it would be worthwhile to tell this to an mm -hmm. audience in a podcast format because we were all listening to podcasts. So why shouldn't we tell something if we have to tell something, uh, if we have something that we could tell? Mm -hmm. So we have a small but amazing team at Süddeutsche Zeitung who in the past years produced great podcasts. And I'm not s saying this as great because it involves the Ibiza affair. I'm saying because great, it's great because I love it as a listener. I listen to them. Uh, also, I'm not normally don't like colleagues um, to talk in my uh, <laughs> not working time, but I listen to them when I'm going uh -huh. for a run. I listen, I listen to them when I, I'm, I'm working at our river in Munich. So it's great. And they have produced podcasts about different uh, topics, for example, about the recent Wirecard scandal. Mm -hmm. They pr have produced a, a, a great podcast about uh, right-wing terrorism here in Germany. And it's getting more and more into our normal working uh, routine. I think we are not anymore also in our name, Süddeutsche Zeitung means South German newspaper. We are not only a newspaper. More like a media corporation. Yeah, kind we of have an, yeah. an iPad format, a uh, homepage, we have podcasts, we have video. Uh, and I think that's important because um, a diff audience, a, we have audiences that more like to read a newspaper, but others like to listen to their news and they want to follow thr thrillers like the Ibiza affair or the wire card scandal in an audio format. Mm -hmm. Perhaps this question is for you. Agnesha wants to know what was the budget for, for, for an investigation. Can you talk about that? Like, <laughs> take, a pi take your pick. Is it the Panama Papers or Paradise Papers or Ibiza? Can you talk about money? How big your <laughs> budget is there? 
Yeah, of course, but but we don't have a budget. That's the problem. We have our small team, mm -hmm. and we try to involve more colleagues from other teams, like the economy team or the, the politics team. Um, but what 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 we have to do, in fact, is if we need more than our usual things that we need, like uh, like if we need a huge laptop, uh, uh, a huge standalone computer for the Panama Papers data, for example. Mm -hmm. um, that was really funny because it, st it started out, you know, we got a part of the data and we went to our boss and said, we need a better computer. Um, but the better computer is not the standard computer that we usually have, like for 350 euros at, at Süddeutsche. So we need one like for 800 euros. And it's not in the system, so I can't order it through the system where we usually order for our company. That will sound very familiar to all the public broadcasters. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> no, no so, so my boss told me, told me, well, just, you know, you buy it somewhere we, where you need to buy it and, uh, and then you, you show me the invoice and I'll sign it. So I, I went to MediaMarkt, which is just an electronics store around, uh, around the corner and I bought the computer and I handed it in and like, Three people in our, our, our company hit me on the head because said that that's not how we buy things here. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? And, and uh, I said, I'm sorry to every one of those. And then we received more data and the computer was too small again and we needed a better one. So we needed a computer for 5,000 euros. And we went back to our, our boss and said, uh, listen, we need a better one, but um, um, it's really expensive. And, he thought about it, and then he said, okay, let's buy that one. It's but there is a limit to it, isn't it? It's, like, it's not like it can come up every now and then. We came back a third time, okay. because they, we had more <laughs> data. And we needed a computer for 17,000 euro. And in the end, he said, you know, this is such an important project. We want to do it. And that, that's how we, how we chuckle. So when we have a really good reason that we need money for something, mm -hmm. we usually get it, but there's a, you know, you have to have a really good project, and if your project sucks after you're published, there won't be money left for the next one. So, yeah. But money being only one part of resources, can you talk a bit about how big your team is, just to get an idea how many people are working on it? I mean, as you say, it's an international collaboration. You can broaden the team, but is there like, a, I don't know, a nucleus team? I think the most important thing is not money, but it's time. Um, we have the mm -hmm. luxury situation that we are working in a team of less than 10 people, um, less than 10 reporters um, working on investigations of Süddeutsche, but we, have, we are in the luxury position that nobody expects us to work on a daily basis in regards to like publishing on a daily basis. We are expected to work on a daily basis investigating. And if such an investigation um, lasts a week, a month, or even more than a year, as in the case of the Panama Papers, we should have a good project in the end and a good publication <laughs> and a good finding. <laughs> Probably, yeah. But as long as we d uh, do have such findings, no boss has ever asked us um, to reduce what we are doing, to, to do more stories. Or, uh, well, there was a boss telling us to do a little bit more, but nobody would uh, cut our time. And I think that's the best thing. It's not a measurement at the end of a year saying, well, look, you need to have no. 30 articles with your byline and then you have done a successful year or something. That's not the way you measure things. No, and uh, I think you can't measure investigative journalism um, in money. Uh, if your controller wants to measure the input and output of an investigative team, I think the result would be devastating uh, from a money perspective. Uh, no, 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 no. But <laughs> from a, uh, if you want to speak in, in those marketing terms um, and controller terms, I think investigative journalism is something that helps you to make your brand known. Mm -hmm. um, it helps you to get a better connection with your audience. We have subscribers that send us postcards, that send us letters, that even sometimes send us chocolate um, or sometimes drinks. <laughs> um, or information. Yeah, or information, because yeah. they want, they identify themselves with our outlet because of the investigations yeah. that we have done and that we are doing. Yeah. Johannes is asking um, a question, I was asking this myself. Perhaps it's a bit about measurement of success, perhaps it's about working past egos. Isn't it about egos when at the end of the day you can say, well, it was us um, made the vice chancellor of Austria step back it's mm, we were part of people going on to the street and making mass protests is this like a f i don't know a feeling of satisfying or perhaps power or is this the wrong question because that's not why you do things 
I don't really like this this way of thinking no. because um, um, we have done a number of really important investigations and nothing happened after it. Mm. It just fell from the table. You know, like, li like the story about the best friend of Vladimir Putin in the Panama Papers. Mm -hmm. No one cared in Russia, but it was a really important story. Uh, there, were, there were millions and millions and billions involved there and the money flew out of Russia and no one cared. Was the story worse because of that? No, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. And with the Strache thing, we are, we are of course happy when we see that people show interest for, for what we are publishing. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, if he has to step back or not, that's not our thing. We tell the people what we know and we show and, uh, and we argue and, and you know, we, 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 we do our journalism. And if they then hit the streets, you know, if thousands go to Ballhausplatz in Vienna and, and say he has to go, then that's their part. And it's not, I don't feel uh, any better mm -hmm. or any w worse. I just, I mean, it's really impressive and you have to get used to this. And we were like, like kind of, you know, un you know, observers who couldn't believe what they saw. And, and then we had to restart the work and we had to tell our readers what was happening. We had to report all that. That's our job. But we never say that, um, that we threw them out of the government or something like that, because they did that themselves mm -hmm. by behaving like they did. We but just reported that. But you're talking about responsibility, don't you? It's like you, when you sit together, like, what could happen if we do this? Um, sometimes you are responsible for the consequences when you've published something, perhaps, I mean, in Germany and Austria, yes, it could be yeah. civilized or it could be, well, civilized probably is not the right word, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Probably so not violent mass protests in other countries, it's a different cup of tea. We are looking at the range, mm -hmm. you know, we're looking, okay, what could happen? Well, our guess was that n n nothing happened in Austria because it's Austria. So um, we made plans for the weekend, by the way, that we all had to uh, 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 <laughs> shut up. Um, but I hope you're not mentioning that one here. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but um, of course, we, we think about that. And in this case, you know, in it's a case, of course, we said, well, in a, in a normal, normal democracy, he would have to leave office probably. But uh, you know, that's not our cup of tea. And, and of course, what we do, what you always do is, we think about, you know, security-wise, do we have to protect someone? Do, do, I mean, not in this case, yeah? Mm -hmm. but, but in the Panama Papers case, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we do think about that, but we are not the, the best in making f prognoses. So we, we are, I think that's not our big strength. Forte, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, 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 no. yeah. I will just cut the line here because there's a question from Austria. Johanna oh. Tirntal wants to know, have you ever felt under threat and how do you deal with it? Are there safety precautions in your lives? <laughs> and well, name them. No, well <laughs> 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 sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it changed over the, the past years. When we did the Panama Papers, um, we were prepared, but we would not ha we had no idea where this would lead us. But then after our colleague Daphne Caruana Galizia was killed in Malta, we had the German police asking us if we would need um, bodyguards, for mm -hmm. example. Even at the publication of uh, the, or at the time of the Panama Papers, we had more security guards uh, in the buildings of Süddeutsche Zeitung and the police was uh, driving by a little bit more often than, than usual. Um, but since that, we have taken some more precautions. Um, this there's a huge range from um, blocking access to your address in the public registries, um, the decision if you have your name on your doorbell, um, but you should not imagine us um, running around, driving around with bodyguards or something like that. I think we are both, uh, and the whole team is uh, at Süddeutsche, likes the normal life too much that we would um, do something like that. But we ha speak more about it. Um, also, before actually every pro uh, project and revelation or investigation where we think there might be a um, possible um, danger, we, th yeah. we uh, speak about it, what it means, what it means for, uh, for us and for our families. Um, and of course, something happens uh, more and more uh, often. In the case of um, the Ibiza affair, our colleagues at Spiegel, they received um, letters, one definitely being a death threat. Um, it was 
I'm just quoting out of my mind. I think it was something like, um, th there will be a bullet, we have a bullet here for, for you uh, ready. So it's stuff like that that we are taking more and more seriously because in many cases it's crazy people, but we all know what um, individuals are capable to do. Um, so I think that's more and more um, the bitter side of journalism, even in Europe. I mean, one thing we have to, we have to think about is when we are traveling. Uh, there's now a number of countries that we rather On a blacklist. don't go to. Mm. Um, um, it's not Austria. I think Austria is still fine. Fine was, but think if you if you look at it tomorrow, you will be <laughs> <laughs> at it. But but let's speak about Russia. I mean, um, we we wrote about ten or eleven oligarchs very close to Mr. Putin and their money, and that's you know something they really dislike. And there there was a documentary on on Russian state TV. It was a propaganda hit piece, and they showed our faces, you know, with our c uh, CVs in the camera, and said those are the guys um, who were smearing Mr. Putin. And well, in Russia, that's it's not like kill them, but it was like you know, it's those are now targets. Um, so we would not not go to Russia just for fun now. And when we, we got the chance to interview Mr. Snowden um, in, in Russia, we chose very deliberately the, the day, the first day of the football world championship. Because we so thought... To avoid attention? Yeah, and also because, you know, if they would arrest us on the, on the day that they start the world championship, they don't want to read the headlines, Panama uh, Papers, to get the attention or to hide. Um, yeah, yeah it's see. just yeah. like they don't want to have that on that day. Yeah. So we flew there, we brought our own water, our own, <laughs> own food. We didn't touch anything in the hotel that we would, you know, have eaten. And then we flew out again. But, and we felt really um, strange. Uh, um, but so we have to think about that now. But it's not, you know, we have to think about like, once every two years when we would go to a country where we think, well, maybe it's not a good idea. Mm. Johanna, by the way, says, uh, P.S., thank you from Austria. <laughs> uh, and Kjetil is jumping back to the, to the podcast, asking a question, how do you find the podcast format regarding investiga uh, investigation journalism? Are there pros and cons? I mean, you're not speaking with podcast experts. <laughs> I think there are more <laughs> podcast experts in the audience <laughs> than here on this panel. But... Um, I personally like the format because you can follow um, a reporter or several reporters and investigative work is detective work. Mm -hmm. So there's a natural tension uh, in such a, such a format. But of course there is um, downsides of it. Um, in many cases we have interviews or background talks with sources where you cannot bring an uh, audio recorder with you because that would basically shy away the source. Um, but this would be the interesting parts. And so then simply you have to find a workaround speaking on a recorder afterwards, but you have to make the decision what can you tell at all because normally you give, you give a promise what is on the record, what is uh, off the record and what shall never be mentioned in any uh, way. So I think it's difficult, but uh, as a listener, I like investigative um, podcasts a lot and I hope there will be more of them in the future. Willem from Dutch Radio ask another question. In case you're free to choose your favorite stage, as in medium, I guess, is it FM, so radio, is it podcast, is it TV, or is it as it is now, newspaper? Is there a favorite thing? So for, for my private pleasure, it's, it's certainly podcast. I, I use it a lot because... Correct uh, answer. Sorry? <laughs> 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 of course. <laughs> no, no, actually, I have two kids. And, and you know, it's, um, I don't even have a printed newspaper at home anymore because I don't find, find the time to sit down and read it. But I know if I do the dishes, if I'm walking, my, walking to school or back when I brought the kids, if I'm cycling to work, I can always listen to podcasts. And so that's a, that's a really good format. And I prefer it um, to radio because I can listen to it whenever I want. And so that's like watching Netflix. That's how I'm now socialized. <laughs> and I, I like it a lot. And when in our working sphere, I also... So, so we're doing many stories in a year. 
And we always very, very proud when our podcast colleagues ask, hey, let's do a podcast there. Or when we can you know, convince them we need a podcast. And because that shows that, that, that that's a topic, that's an issue that not only us do think that people care about because they want to make it a podcast. And we only have so much podcasts a week. So, um, yeah, we, we, we have fans. Is it a strategic decision? Let's say the, the, the management of the house in, is involved saying, well, look, we have done Panama Papers, we have done Paradise Papers. It would be good in regards of good PR for the brand to do it as podcast as well? Or is it you approaching the podcast section or the podcast section approaching you? How, how is this decision process made? To be honest, I have a lack of insight. I know what we uh, <laughs> like try to encourage our colleagues or pitch to them, but I don't know, know, don't know the backstory of that one, if there was somebody encouraging them to do a podcast <laughs> together with us. Um, but, I mean, we all are all listening, or at least the, the two of us, um, when the podcast thing came up, we listened to the cool podcasts, um, but they are mainly, were mainly not from Germany at the beginning. And of course, there was always this idea like, hey, why is there not something like that in Germany? It was this startup uh, feeling at that, at that time when everybody wanted to try it. Some of us failed, um, <laughs> but some not. Um, and we wanted to give it a try. And we had colleagues um, in our newsroom that had experience um, with radio formats, with um, audio formats, who did already long time feature series. So that was, a, I think, a perfect match um, to do it with them. And I think that was one of the early hours or minutes mm -hmm. of the now uh, podcast and audio team at Süddeutsche Zeitung. Mm -hmm. the, first, so the first podcast that I said was an investigative podcast about the Paradise Papers. Mm -hmm. um, I can still remember when, when we, signed, uh, 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 we signed for the money for the microphones and the stuff that we needed <laughs> to, to, to make the podcast. So um, we, we were big fans and, and, and they do fantastic work there and we try to to be in a constant dialogue with them and so that we inform them what we're planning and if they have an idea i think in, in the case of wirecard which is now at spotify i think they had the idea to have a podcast about that so it's um yeah i think like it should be mm -hmm. i was wondering about another aspect you were mentioning uh, in your talk when you were talking about the cake saying, of course, there are other ingredients coming to the cake, but also there's like stuff coming back. Can you give an example? It's like sometimes are uh, things popping up somewhere else, let's say in Iceland, and the Icelandic colleagues are coming to you saying, well, look, this name in the paper sounds, I don't know, German, Austrian, whatsoever. Can you deal with it because we have no clue? Well, if we take, for example, um, the Panama Papers, we had that leads to one of the best friends um, of Vladimir Putin, the, the fam now famous uh, cellist uh, Sergei Roldugin, and him sitting in a huge web of offshore companies. And we also, um, we were investigating this web of companies for a month. And when we brought in um, our Russian colleagues, they, within days, found relations. They, for example, found a relation that one of those companies was involved in financing um, the place where um, Putin's daughter had her wedding. That's mm. something we would have never, ever found. Even, I think, after one or two years of investigation, or even five years. Without our Russian colleagues, no way. That was something that made of a good story a very good story. And I think that was the moment where we could really see the cake getting bigger and bigger. Mm. And most, most importantly, I think, no, Most of the stories worldwide, the 5,000 stories that I mentioned, we would not have found because we had no clue who is important in Iceland or in Peru, in Uruguay or in Togo. But, you know, our colleagues knew that. So they were looking for those people in the data. And the, the, the Panama Papers data is like you only find what you're looking for. So if you don't type in the Prime Minister of Iceland, mm -hmm. you would not find him. Mm -hmm. So um, that's really something that um, 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 is, is very important that we would have had, you know, as if we would have done you know, all the, inv the investigation alone, maybe we had 150 stories or 200 stories, but we would have lost so many stories mm -hmm. and the cake would would have been all ours, yeah? Mm -hmm. But it, w it would small. be a small cake. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so it's it's... It's really ridiculous to think that we, w we could have done it alone because, you know, 
I don't even know who is really important in Switzerland, and that's our neighbor, or in France. You know, I know Macron, yeah, but uh, there it stops. That, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so um, um, it's not possible to do something that internationally alone. Oh, oh. What about, um, I mean, so there's, as you say, at the end of the year, there's not like a measurement of success as long as it is, let's say, it pays to the brand and it strengthens the brand, then your company's fine with it. So there are, of course, if you wouldn't publish anything there, at some point they would say, well, look, what's <laughs> up there. But as long as it works like that, you can work independently, more or less, choose where you look at Definitely. what the next um, topic is. And I really hope that uh, our editors and bosses are not thinking that much about the brand, but uh, more about the public interest. Mm -hmm. Because the stories that we are doing, that's at least our hope, are important for society. It's important to uncover them. Um, and coming back to your question, yes, we decide mostly of our own what we are investigating. But of course, there's sometimes um, editors who tell you like, well, we see this little small uh, scandal getting bigger and bigger. Doesn't your team want to have a look into that one as well? Um, and of course, as we all know, you can turn bosses down once or twice, mm -hmm. but then it's getting difficult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I feel still a huge freedom um, of spending weeks and months in investigations that we think um, are important. And I think that's something that an investigative team really needs. Um, you need that freedom to find new ideas or find new topics. Um, and also, if you have found one, to think about new ways of investigating stuff. And I think one of the good ways of finding new ways to tackle a problem is speaking with colleagues, speaking with colleagues in other countries. Have they investigated such a topic already? What tools did they use in a technical way, but also like what did they, which questions did they ask themselves at the beginnings, what mistakes did they, they made, and then learn from them. And by the way, one more reason um, that speaks for sharing is that you get the favor back. Mm -hmm. So we had many, many stories since the Panama Papers where people approached us and said, hey, look, I've got a great story. Do you want to get on board? And it doesn't even have to be about, um, about Germany. So we did stories about China that had nothing to do with Germany, but we got invited because, you know, the people felt we had shared. Now, now it's their, par their part to share. Rep a reputation as well. Like you can ask these guys and you can work with them. So this, is, this builds over years, I guess. Yes, but you need to be invited. So mm. if they, you know, if, for example, um, um, when, when, when we did the Panama Papers collaboration, we could have, you know, acted like like idiots and said, we want to dictate everything and we publish when we want and we do it like, uh, no one would have wanted to work with us uh, anymore. So, so it's really important in these kinds of investigations that uh, you're kind and that you are kind of likable and to build not, not only trust, but you know, if there are colleagues in Rolf that everyone hates, Th that person is not going to be, be invited the next time. And it's not a team player anyway. No. Yeah. Last question comes from Leslie. Next topic. <laughs> Very good question. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> <laughs> but is it like that there are still some, I don't know, some data of the Panama Papers, you say, well, we, we, we put them aside for when there's nothing else going on and we will have a closer look over the summer break or something? Does it work like that or is it... At least that's... We <laughs> thought it would <laughs> work like, but there's stuff like that we, we, that we put aside five years ago and still have not investigated um, to the end. Um, but of course, the Panama Papers are something that we are always getting back now. Mm. To whatever topic we are investigating, one step after Googling a name or the name of a company is putting that name in our search engine uh, and searching the Panama Papers for such a name. Mm -hmm. And there is still, I would say, even nearly... A Every week, a story somewhere in the world being published where there's bits and pieces of the Panama Papers in there. But of course, we don't put that huge Panama Papers stamp on it anymore because people are getting bored by it. Us as well. So <laughs> you're simply referring to leaked data or data, internal data of Mossack Fonseca or stuff like that. Johannes is just chatting, so the 17,000 euros computer is still at good use. <laughs> yes, he is. He is still <laughs> being used, and uh, we hope there will be soon more, n more new data. So if, if you have, yeah. <laughs> we're still there. Yeah, so thank you very much, Bastian and uh, Frederick Obermeier, investigative reporters of the Zutotje Zeitung, and thank you for sharing, and thank you for being 
so kind, likable, and sharing this with us tonight. Thank you so much.